this is the part of the video. If you haven't seen the first part, the first part is building the fuselage. I built that first. The tune pipe body is complete. We're going to start on the wing and tail today. We have the foam cores. And step one, obviously, is going to be get out our best wood. Figure out how many sheets we need. We need about 20 sheets of good wood. So what I do is go through my sheeting, try to pick out the best. Uh, if you can see this, I don't want to pull this apart. If you can see what I've already done off camera, I've taken all the wood and put the grain weight on each sheet. Now these are all 4 inch by 36s. So you know these are reasonable quality wood. And we got the good ones down around 12.2. For four inch wood, that's pretty reasonable. You really don't want to have ultra, ultra punk wood. I've got them in order because the first thing I want to do is take out the parts for the tail. I want the tail pieces first. The lightest wood always goes in the tail. The heavy wood can put on the outboard wing. But you want the light wood. For sure, for absolutely sure, you want the lightest wood that you have. And the elevators and stab. Lightest in the elevators, next lightest in the stab. A good way to think about it is the further away from the center of gravity you get, the heavier the wood can be. The closer to the center of gravity you get, you can start to use up some of your lousy wood. Now I've got a real nice piece here. I'd make, probably make my elevator. That, that's only seven grains a sheet. That's three inch sheets. The heaviest one of the three inch sheets is 9.5. The lightest one of the four out of four inch sheets is 13.7. So the first start of it, the first part of this is to lay out the sheets that we need, and then we're going to trim the edges. I'll show you the little fixture I use to trim the edges. In fact, I'll get that right now. That can be step one. And this is a little tool that Dave Mitchell made me. It's nothing but a giant sheet of Koran. Corel, I think they call it a Koran. <laughs> Digging it a well, Muslim Bible. It separates. <coughs> and then it slides on pins, if you can see the pins. So what happens, when I take a sheet of wood, and I drop the sheet of wood down in there, and I drop this over the pins, the pins are precision fit. I just run a knife down there and I've got a precision fit for one edge of the wood. I've been able to do as many as six at a time when I'm trying to make production. I'm not going to try to do anything production on this video so you'll get the most benefit out of it. Okay, this has a pin on each end. You can see the pin up the other end. That's what we're going to do to join the sheeting. That'll be the next step in here. We're going to need some thin hot stuff to join sheeting and Luckily, we don't have any, as usual, so that works out good. Our first step, first step is going to be to run down. Okay, the first thing we're going to do, I've got my sheeting ready. I've got my fixture for trimming it. I'm going to take four of these sheets, and I'm going to use 30 second on the tail. I've got four inch by 36 sheets. I want to get the step one is to get the uh, edge trimmed. So I lay sandwich this in in my fixture. Now if you don't have a fixture you can use a uh, the edge of a glass table, a ruler. You've got to get perfectly straight joints. That's the first thing. Step one. A brand new blade. And just trim right down the edge. I'm doing all four at once now. Get off the scrap. Now on a wing, I like to use 16th. I don't like to use the thinner sheeting on a wing. But on a tail, especially being this tail, is only going to be 28 inches. I think we can live with this. Seen quite a few planes that the tail has folded on because the wood is too thin, uh, too punky. This is not particularly uh, the lightest wood I have, but it's the wood that has the straightest grain. Uh, I get this up on the edge of the table. Sand out this joint. Pull our fix 
extra part, and now we can kind of lay that one there, this one here, and see if we've got nice joints. Now for the tail, the way we do the tail, it's not really important to have a good joint. I'm not too concerned with the joint itself, but I do want to have straight edges more than anything else. There's certainly a lot of different techniques for joint and sheeting. The way I'm going to try to join these, keep in mind this is the tail skins. Spread some tape on this. Squeeze them together as I lay the tape down. Hot press is a good way. One of the downsides of doing it with hot stuff that I've found is you always see the joints coming up because the hot stuff is so hard to sand and so brittle, you do tend to see the joints more in the sheeting. And one of the nice things, if you do it the way I'm showing you here, you probably won't see the joints after you put the plane out in the sun for a while. Now the trick is to make sure you've got flat sheeting, that this isn't all ripply. If it's ripply, well you know you're shot down. You know that ain't going to be a good piece of sheeting. That one doesn't look too bad. I'll put this one aside for the time being. Join up the other one. This one has a bad edge. I want to sand this edge off. Now it just shows you, even though we did that in the fixture, we're going to have to go back and do it over because we pulled up a little piece of the wood. Right here, we pulled up a little chunk of the wood. And I want to true that up. One of the things I think, I, I think you can separate the, the very top planes, the front row planes from the second row planes, is the joints and the sheeting after they've been out in the sun for a while. And I certainly uh, notice it. I'm sure there's other people that notice it. People that judge probably don't have the time to really look it over, but all your fellow flyers, I'm sure the first thing they can, one of the first things they're going to look at is run a hand over the top of the wing, see if they can feel the sheeting joints. And if you're going to use hot stuff, I'm not going to use hot stuff. If you decide to use hot stuff, leave the sawdust right on. The sawdust will help kick the hot stuff off. But I'm not going to use it for this tail skin anyway. First off, when you're dealing with 30 second sheet, which is this thin, you really don't need to uh, have that hard, that hard line that the hot stuff leaves. I'm going to do these with Sigment. Now, Sigment is like Amberoid. I guess you could use Amberoid. Just kind of press them together. You don't have to put them in a vise. And the main thing is, when you have the sheet down like this, Make sure it's perfectly flat. If this thing is all bowed and rippled, well, you know, now I got a bad spot here. We're going to do away with that. That's not a factor. But the joint itself, you want to be real nice. Now, this, the skins have not been glued yet. All I'm doing is trying to get a light sanding on them with three twenty, so I can get an even joint. It doesn't really pay any price right now to get an even joint. You don't want that joint sticking up through the finish when we're all done. But that joint is going to be the idea of using segment on a tail. By the way, is this the sheeting is thin, and I really don't want to have that hard spot. Even though we're not going to really see this, this is going to disappear. If you use Sigment or Ambroid in joints that show on the outside of the finish, you'll probably be able to sand the joints off pretty easy. When you use other kind of glue, epoxy, 
hot stuff, the more than likely those joints are going to come through after that flame's been out in the sun a while. And of course, when you can use any color other than white to paint the flame, white will kind of help hide the fact that the joints are showing up. The darker colors are going to show them almost instantly. What we're going to do is spread this, <coughs> let's see if you can see this joint, spread this out so you have a little trough. And just take the ambroid or the sigment and run it right down in the trough. Use plenty, you don't have to be cheap with this. This doesn't dry heavy like other glues. Remember in the old days when you used to build a whole plane with ambroid and the planes had come out a little lighter? Well, one of the reasons is the glue. This glue is light. When it dries, it almost all evaporates. There's nothing left. Now, this is certainly not the only technique. Now, you can see I got a bead of that segment in there, and I'll run it back and forth a few times, look down. Some of it's going to run down onto the mask and tape, that's for sure. Grab myself a brand new paper towel and just force it down, rubbing it in at the same time. And it's a good idea to make up what, what's a really nice idea is to try two or three different techniques if you have the extra wood. Sand out the sheet, see which ones come out the lightest, or it's straightest, or both. And then use the best ones on your, you know, really good plane. And maybe save the other ones for if you're building a nostalgia plane or give them away to your friends that are just coming up the ranks. Now again, that's just one technique for joining the sheet. We're going to have to let this dry now. Another thing too, I got a little split in the sheeting out here. I'm going to fill that in while I, while I have the sigma in here. On the 16th sheet on a wing, it's probably okay to use CA. I guess it's a little better, but I've noticed on this thin sheeting, and this is 30 second sheeting, it's only 32 thousandths, so whatever it is, it's really <coughs> hard to get rid of that joint after a while. Okay, now after we gotta let this dry a half hour, and then we're gonna get on with uh, sanding the cores and things like that. Right, these are the foam cores. Well, the first thing I do is I mark them so I can always set these back in the right cradle. You put angles on them. This will help you get them back in the right cradle. <coughs> Not a bad idea. Mark them in all dimensions. Even if some of these lines come off, you're going to have a problem. Because a lot of times I'll be building three or four planes at once and I get the cradles confused with, especially being they're all the same. Just make different lines on each side. And you can always put these back. Put two in the back on this one and we'll know which is which. Okay, this is going to be our foam cores that are going to be for this ship. And from this point on, we want to keep the same core in the same cradle as possible. For all the work we're going to do, it'll help with alignment. Now these cores are already marked for the amount of wood that's got to be removed in the center for making our hinges. They're already marked. Now step one for all of this, I like to use half of the core. Step one is to just gently sand these. We need a 400 paper. Gently sand this out. Bring it out all the way down. but sometimes you want to get a nice smooth surface for the glue to stick to. Now one of the most common problems people have is they don't blow and vacuum the dust off of the cores. Then when they do the spray cement or epoxy, it's really only sticking to the dust. And of course that's bullshit. You don't want that. You want this to be sticking to a nice tight surface. Okay, 
Just a snapshot of what it looks like. And I'm gonna vacuum it with vacuum cleaner. Now, when I go to turn this over, I'll do a little sanding, but put it right back in its same core. Take the other one off. Now, sand. Now, whether you're doing a magnum or whatever, it doesn't matter. If you're going to try to dry down all the way to foam, you have to hyperburn it pretty heavy for that. And you can use epoxy. And you can have guys like Scott Smith do it one time. And then you see it nice and foam on your work itself. And you see how much work's involved. The price that they charge it just looks pretty reasonable. But the more seasoned kids will do it a lot faster and a lot more efficiently than you if this is your first one or your second one. And it's got a nice finish. You can see about how much I'm sanding it for. It's got a nice finish on it. And then I do is I take a vacuum cleaner and vacuum them. And after they're vacuumed, I take it over to my air hose and I bank press it to about 100 pounds and blow it about, actually blow into the small pockets of foam. You're never going to get the foam perfectly flat. You're always going to have little, little food craters. And the idea here is not, not to get on the dust and let the dust, because the dust is not going to stick to the foam. You want to get the wood and of course vacuum and blow dry the wood too. That's real important too. But just to give you an idea of about how much sanding is involved. Now I'll do the other one off camera. In fact, what I'll do just to, uh, let's see how much stuff comes off of it. This is my shop vac on a long hose. This will get some of it off. And most of it comes off with compressed air. And if you don't use the compressed air, you really run the risk of it. Yeah, a lot of the junk just comes right up when you do this. And I like to keep them in the cores all the while. Because obviously these are delicate parts at this point in time. Easy to hurt and warp. Now the next step, I don't have an air hose in here right now. I'm going to have to get a longer hose so I can do this on video. But <clears throat> just blow that hose off. Blow it up with an air hose. Blow that off. And we'll sand the other one off camera. And we're just going to extend those lines up from the tips. Now because I'm going to use carved rounded tips on this, I'm going to have to adjust the end here by the thickness of the block. Now, the tape is set up about 20 minutes on this sheeting. I'm just going to let this sit for about, uh, pull the tape off and let that sit for another 20 minutes before we sand it down. If you're using hot stuff, of course, you're ready to go now. You don't have to wait for this extra step. And I'll prepare the cores now. Sand the sheeting with 400, get it final sanded. Usually this has to dry an hour or so before you can sand it down. Now what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to line up the joint of the sheeting with the hinge line and sheet this in one piece. Then we'll cut the middle out. We're going to cut the bar out of the middle put in the two pieces of wood that then are the trailing edge and the leading edge. So we want to try to line up the gap if we can. That's why we used four inch sheeting. We want to try to line that up as good as we can. So the next step is going to be on this guy. We want to cut the sheeting right in half now. It's 36 so we'll just cut it at 18 and this doesn't have to be super accurate. We have four pieces of sheeting. We'll do four sheeting pieces at once in one operation. I'm 
we're not going to see any of these joints, so it's not really important that we square them all up and get them true. Now this is Greenaway's way of doing a tail. This tail now has the hinge line on it, and we have the sheeting on this. Once we put the glue, we're going to try to line up the seam with the hinge line, and we're going to actually take the seam out. You won't even see the seam when we're finished, but we'll try to do that. And if you don't get it lined up, you'll just have to sand off that joint. But this way you actually see no joints in the tail sheeting at all. And you do get the grain going dead parallel, which is important too. You really don't want the grain, in this case, running with the leading edge. You're losing some of your strength. You want the grain to go dead with the, dead with the hinge line. That's where you're getting the most strength. We'll take the inch and a half off of this side. That's going to allow us, of course, save this for sanding blocks. This is a nice little sanding block. This is the piece we're removing so we can run rounded elliptical wing tips like I have on most of the cardinals and stuff. Get this thing sanded in. Just back in the core. Off another sanded block. And if you're just going to use standard size wing tips, well, you just glue them right on. But in my case, because of the elliptical shape, a lot of that wing tip gets rounded off. I don't want to wind up with a 35 inch span tail. I want the span of the tail to be about 28, so I'll move off. I'll trace out my lines back on this now. We'll make these different than the other side. Just so we have different kind of lines on this. And we'll be ready to sheet as soon as that sheeting dries up and we can sand it out. Now remember, because this is 30 second sheet, we don't want to get crazy carried away and make this thing paper thin. I'm just going to sand each side a little bit. The side you had the tape on sometimes picks up a little bit of the glue and you can wipe it off with alcohol. In this case, not a problem. We're going to cut it right off. Now, it's good to just take and make an incline right down where the hinge line is. This will just help you on alignment. Okay. We've got a line now down that wood. And we'll take one of the cores. And when we glue this, we're going to spray the glue on and just try to line that up. Line it up and rock it back and forth. Trim it off and do the other side. Now I'm going to have to spray this glue outside. This glue is, makes me sick to my stomach. I'm going to take these, blow them off a little bit, blow the final dust, spray some 3M77 cement, which in case you never saw a can of it, it's available in hardware stores. If you can't find it out by you, uh, you can get some from Pro Stun Products. The, uh, there's, a, there's a same kind of glue that's 77N. You don't want to have the N. It's 77, period. The N will melt the foam. This is the kind of glue you want to use. you got to shake the hell out of the can, and it's a good idea if you're going to do this, leave the can in a warm room overnight, because if this stuff gets cold, it really gets to be a pain in the ass to work with. Now what I like to do, because I have extra sheeting here, 
I'm going to kind of mark out where this tail should go so I'm not wasting a lot of glue and stuff. I can trim that off. And like I said, they don't want to breathe in too many of the fumes from this glue. There's people it doesn't bother. I'm For some reason it bothers me. The glue really has a toxic odor. If you can, you could do the whole thing with a fan on. I guess it would help. Now I just got done spraying these outside. What I do, I take my fingertip, and when I can pick this up, you can see how sticky it's getting. Do a little test, make sure it's getting good and sticky. I guess we're waiting about a minute or so. Of course, I got the glue on the core too. The core will take a little, for some reason, takes a little longer to dry. Probably because we got more glue on it. Put a good healthy coat of glue on it. I mean, nothing worse than having that sheeting lift. That can really be aggravating. This is starting to get sticky now. When you can start picking it up with your finger, you know, you. there you go. Wait till you can pick it up with your finger free. And probably just wait another 30 seconds or so. Again, we want to try to drop this down and line up the line. So we got that hinge line. We'll just cut out right in the middle of the sheeting in one glop. You only get one chance to do this. You don't get two chances to do this. So it's a good idea to set up and get ready. Okay, that's starting to get real sticky now. That's about right, right now. Of course, there's more than one way to do this. There's epoxy. Just to name a few, there's core bond, the stuff you can buy from SIG, the brush on stuff. I think the 3M is about the lightest. And any one I've ever done with 3M, I've never had the sheeting left so far. So two of them have been concourse winners. So I guess we're in good shape on that. Now, I want to line up the two lines. i got to turn this over. Try to line up that line with that line. Press down the hinge line, roll it forward, and it should pick up. Roll it back. So you don't, now you're not sticking. Okay, there it goes. We just try to rush this a little bit, I guess, because we're on camera. Give it a good press down. I like to do this right away is trim off all the excess wood because when you go to put the second piece on, needless to say, it's going to stick to that. That sticky glue is going to really stick. So we'll just leave a little bit of sheeting out, sticking out the back here. And that sheeting has glue on it. It's a pain in the neck. You rid of this razor, this ain't too sharp. So. I'm working on the edges like this. I just like to use a new razor. Now I call babysitting this for about 15 minutes. Just keep pressing down the sheeting, looking for spots that might lift up on you. Get rid of all that sticky sheeting, that crap. Oh, there we go. As I'm talking, one sticks to the table. Lovely. Get rid of all the scrap. Okay, we'll wait about five minutes for this to set up nice, and then we'll get on to doing the second piece of sheeting. Okay, mark the two pieces that we're going to try to do the alignment on. And of course, this sheeting has this, the glue on it already. It's getting good and sticky. Core is already sticky. You can hold it up with your hand. So I want to get the same the same hinge line that I have on the other piece. You only get one chance to drop this down too. Roll it down. I like to let this sit for about an hour or so before I glue the leading and trailing edges on. Just keep babysitting the back of it. 
Make sure she's pressed down nice. If you want to, you could put this right back in the core now and leave it sit with a brick on it or something for a while. Or you can just wait 15 minutes and glue the leading and trailing edges on. Do that. Okay, so we got one set, one core ready. Our next thing is we're going to cut the hinge line out and put in the solid wood. And of course, this way you guarantee that you got a match there for it. Okay, that core has been sitting overnight now. Next step we're going to do is pull off the tape. Put little pieces of tape on here holding the sheeting down. We'll pull the tape off. Get yourself a brand new razor blade. Trim off the leading and trailing edges, of course. This tape just holds the sheeting down a little bit. We let this dry overnight with a gallon of nitrate dope on the cores, just to make sure it's good and solid. Looks like we got a good one here. The sheeting is nice and solid. leading and trailing edge down. Again, I'm going to go through my wood and try to get the lightest pieces of wood. I try to keep the tail really light. There's one part of the plane you want to have relatively light as the tail. I'll look through my wood see if I can dig out some real nice pieces here.
again, the reason it looks like I'm using up scrap wood is this is scraps of super light wood that I have. This is probably under four pounds of square inch. Super punky wood. There's really very little strength back here. I'm using now is white glue, good old Elmer's glue, alphatic resin, to attach the leading and trailing edges. Trying not to leave a lot of glob squeezing out here, because I don't want to sand it out. We got thin sheeting. I don't want to have to sand that out if possible. Here, yep, there we need enough tape to hold it in place so you don't have to go crazy munching it down or anything. Alphatic doesn't dry too fast so you've got good working time. You don't have to go rush and rush and do this. get too much along the edge. smooth even coat of glue on there. So for the straight side here.
Now we just have to let this dry for half an hour. So all that alphatic sets up. Keep a nice even tension on it. And we'll trim that off and gouge out the hinge line. Now this is the number two set. That phone call that just was on was Jimmy Casale just cut three of his fingers up on a table saw. And as I'm thinking about that, I'm using a razor blade and daydreaming along here. Needless to say, I have cut myself on this kind of stuff, daydreaming and thinking about go-go girls or whatever, and all of a sudden, yow. Now we're trimming this up, and then I'll have the two cores. I'll put the leading and trailing edge on this, and I'll let this dry probably for the rest of the day. Jimmy cut his fingers on a saw. Yeah, he chopped them good. Last night, that's what that call was about. How about a cup of coffee? I still got the camera running. How about a cup of coffee, Bonzo? He's coming over to drop some water off. I don't know. When I was doing a Nobler video, I cut myself pretty decently and uh, managed to get it on video even. Then I went back and erased it. I figured out if everybody saw me cut a, cut my finger on video, they think I'm an idiot. But uh, now I'll confess I am an idiot. Uh, I guess we all cut ourselves up and do that kind of stuff. And I don't think there's anybody that hasn't done a little number on himself. Anyway, we'll put the leading and trailing edges on this guy. Then we'll have the two stab halves together. Then we're going to try to gouge out, put the core, the sheeted core, into one of the cradles, mark off the material we want to take out for the hinge line, and take it out with the uh, Dremel tool, with, with the Dremel saw. Once we take that out, we'll be ready to do the same thing of putting the leading and trailing edges on this guy. It's real important as you go along to make mirror images, make both sides of the tail exactly the same length, the same width, the same thickness. real important in the back of these not to just join the sheeting and leave it. They always warp if you do that. I always leave a little bit of foam, cut back enough into it that a little bit of foam sticks out, and then use either a 3 8 piece or a quarter inch and then taper it in. Of course, there's a lot of people that have uh, prefer fat trailing edges, thick trailing edges. The reason is if you're prone to build things that warp, that would probably help. I don't know if you can look down at it and see how straight it is. Let's see. Eh, it's not too bad. I like to keep the trailing edge real thin. 
back to Billy Warwich and I, when we went to the Dayton Museum, we were looking at the thickness of trailing edges on aeroplanes. And almost every one of them on a real aeroplane, the trailing edge is thicker than what we use on a sunship. So I have to assume some of those aeronautical engineers, you know, a lot of these guys are really bozos, but there's got to be some of those engineers that know what they're doing. And they wouldn't have done that just at random. Sure, they, they did that after experimenting with thick and thin trailing edges. Believe it or not, the only ship we found that had a really thick relative trailing edge was the X, uh, the X X15, the black thing, the long black cigar shaped thing. That had a pretty thick trailing edge. All the saber jets and everything come to a razor point. But of course they're not made out of balsa wood and they're not worried about the kind of things we're worried about. That's pretty nice. All right, I'm gonna glue this up get my uh, wood out. So by tomorrow, we should have both of these things in one piece. It's ready to start making some, some real progress on a tail. I don't have to make up the horns yet. Again, try not to leave the glue drip out over the edges. That's a pain. And you sure don't have to worry about getting too much glue, excessively gluing this, putting on a pound and a half of glue. Just enough to hold the sheeting to the quarter inch leading edge. And certainly there's a lot of people cutting foam wings and a lot of people with different techniques with glue and different ways of doing things. And this certainly is not the only way by any means, but this is the way that uh, Jim Greenaway has used for years and taught me. And I've been pretty successful with it, so I'm not prone to change it. sit down in front of the camera, we'll be doing the hinge line on this, and then doing all the supports for the horn, the tips. I usually leave the tips to last. The reason for that is then you get the blend at the end, just perfect. It's the easiest way to do the tips is just do them absolutely last. And I want to get the span of this to come out to be exactly 28 inches so that my uh, space age calculations of areas and cubic displacements come out right.
So we've let this dry overnight, and we're about ready to carve and sand this, get the center lines on it. I think I'll do the carving and sanding first, and I'll put the uh, trough in for the hinge lines. May not be able to work on this too long today. Got other projects over at the shop to work on. I'll try to get an hour or so in on this project. I'll let this white glue dry overnight. It's a little easy to sand when you don't try to rush it. If you rush it, you probably can get away with sanding it after 45 minutes or an hour. If you let it dry overnight, it's still a little easier. Again, if you only looked at the first three tapes of this video, the tune pipe body, this is the tail that's going to go in the tune pipe body. He might be selling this as a separate video, I don't know. Okay, we got our two cores. First thing we'll try to do is cut some of this extra wood off. Obviously, because it's 30 second sheet, don't get too carried away and try to nail it right in there. Just go right up to it. get the big chunk of it done with the, uh, the 26 blade, then finish it up with a block with 320. When you're doing a tail that has 16 sheet, you can be a little more aggressive about carving it down. This, I don't think we're going to be able to, we're going to have to really take our time here. So I don't want to thin out that 30 seconds any more than it already is. the ends with a zona saw of course, not a knife, you won't crush the wood as bad. Especially when you're dealing with soft wood, when you try to cut it against the grain, it just mushes it all up. Obviously one of the most important things to keep in mind is to keep the center lines on these, any part that you're making, including this. As soon as we get this airfoil sanded out, we'll try to get some center lines on this.
up to the stage roller block sanding out the leading and trailing edges before we do the hinge bar. From this point on, we'll try to do all our sanding with a block. Keep the integrity of everything here. Getting the center line on. Now that the core is sanded out, we want to get the center line on here. All we need that center line on there for is to line up the middle of the stab. Oh, I drew it through the whole piece just so I can keep track of it. What we did, we taped the piece to the core and just sawed out the hinge line. Of course, the amount is a quarter and three eighths. That's going to be the leading and trailing edge. And once those pieces get matched up and glued in, that's actually the next step right now. Sometimes it's easier to glue these with the tips right into the core. When you take them out, you can get the final sanding on them. on this with some 320 and a block. So what I'm doing, I'm getting a second set ready now. Then I'm going to put on the leading and trailing edges. Let that dry. And the next time we come back to work on it, we'll sand out those leading and trailing edges. Now, one of the things that's important to do as you pull this tape off, this is where I want to get this on, on the video, is be sure every step of the way you're making mirror images. Mirror images meaning you have the two sides of the tail, the elevators, the stab, all the same dimension. So I'm taking this one, and I'm taking its twin, and I want to marry them up. First off, married them up this way, make sure they're identical. Married them up this way. You sure don't want to have one elevator bigger than the other. And of course, if you don't, if they're not equal in every dimension, take the larger of the two and make it the size of the smaller one, which right now you can see we have one that's a little bit bigger than the other. So we'll mirror image these up as the next step. What you can actually do in this case is just sand them together. I have a piece of sanding grit hooked to the table here. I just run it on there. 
just have a sanding belt glued to the table, which is great for doing these mirror image deals. Make sure they're exactly even in every dimension. The edges are equal. Tips are the same. Roots are the same. That's an important step you don't want to leave out. Get those, get those parts that they're dead equal. And I like to do it all along through construction. Every time I work on something, hold the two of them together and try to get them equal. Sight down the trailing edges, make sure they're pretty straight. And these look pretty good. Okay. Now one of the things I really make an all-out attempt at doing is trying to make a super light tail. This is the stab, and this is the cap that we're going to put on here. Now what I've done, I've traced out the exact opening. have the exact shape that that stab is going to be on there. Now this is the inside part. This is the part that's going to go inside. This is a piece of quarter inch wood. I obviously want to leave some material where my hinges are going to go. So I have that trailing edge cap and I run a piece of tape right down it. And now I can get out a little bit of the material there. I can drum that out or carve it out with however I decide to do it. Just making a little trough on each side. Keeping a tail light is certainly an important thing without making it too weak. Now this part normally just goes along for the ride. When we glass the middle of the stab, this is not adding a whole lot of strength, so I can do this. If you're not going to glass the middle of the tail, I suggest you don't do this. Another thing you gain, too, is not having all that glue up there. You save having all that glue all over everything. Of course, if you have a milling machine where you work, you can do this on a milling machine and be real nice. Save a little bit of time and effort. As always, it's just giving it dead weight. Don't give it a weight that does something. Structure. Get rid of dead weight. Of 
course, we'll finalize this with a little piece of uh, 80 grit paper. Piece of eighth inch white ply. Make a good little sanding tool for this. If you ever built a plane that needed nose weight, you know what a hassle it is sticking a chunk of lead in the nose or one of those flywheel weights or something. You save all this time to build a nice light airplane. When you have to add weight to it, it really burns you. This is our final shape. Now if you can see this. So we have this wood in the middle that'll hold the hinges in. This will glue to the top of the tail and we'll have that section hollowed out. Next thing we want to do is plot where in this hinge line we're going to have our hinges and we'll put the slots in right now then we can cut away the rest of the wood. Make a little room here. do is plot exactly where those hinges are going to go and it's a relatively easy thing to do. Obviously we want one as far out as possible. So we'll put one out there. I want three hinges all together. I'll divide the distance by three. These are normal circus circus hinges that I've taken, and you can dye them black. I don't know if you can see these. I just like the look of black hinges a lot more than than uh, white hinges. The white ones always seem to jump up through the paint a little bit more than I'd like. You want to get the hinge out at the end, as far out on the end as possible. That's trick number one, is get that hinge out there. The one in by the fuselage, you don't have to worry about too much. Well, I'm just trying to space these out equally. I measured this out and I just want to see, I want to have three hinges. We don't really need one in by the flap horn. In by the tail horn, that horn will hold that steady. I'm doing is just marking where the hinges are. With some little X's. Okay, now I know that's where the hinges are. 
Now I can take the rest of the material out <coughs> in between. Have to change the tool here for doing that. thinking, oh yeah, this is a lot of work for us to save two or three grains. Two or three grains off the back is going to mean at least five off the front. So the total saving here for maybe a half hour of work could be a quarter ounce off the plane. Now at that rate, if you had a 70 ounce plane in 10 hours, you could turn it into a pretty competitive plane. Never discount this fact. And number one, this is actually going along for the ride. This is not structure we're taking out. That glass cloth on the middle of the stab is what's going to become the structure. Anything you can do to reduce the weight without ruining the integrity of the plane, definitely worth doing. Okay, we've got that kind of thin there. Get a nice finish on this. piece. You got three little lumps of wood. Those hinges are going to come through. This will give them plenty of wood to bite into. Now we got to be able to mark this on the other side of the tail so we know where these hinges are going to be. So I'm just going to put some marks. Get the location of the hinges here. So when I know when I center line the other side, I can't send a line until I assemble it. I know that's where my three hinges will be. Okay, 
in and that marks it so now when I come through this side this will already be glued in and I'll have plenty of wood here to pick up my hinges. Now we're attaching this with white glue. First press it down. Make sure you got a good amount of glue touching that. Oh, okay. Make sure all your alignments are right on the front. Check the alignment so otherwise you're not going to keep those pockets. Now from the outside this tail looks like it's got a quarter inch trailing edge. Where in reality we have kind of a little I-beam of a tail. And we're going to rely on a fiberglass in the middle of the tail, middle of the stab to do our work. So you can see that kind of a look. That's what it looks like at the tip. A neat little trick for sure. I'll have to put this aside work on the other side now and bring it up to this point and by then it'll probably be time to go to work so that might be it for the day Okay, we've got the two edges on the elevators now. No hollowing on the elevators. We're going to get rid of most of that material with the V anyway. Now obviously when we pick up the hinge location, we'll pick it up off the matching part. Alright, this has got to go good night for a while. I think we'll pick this up tomorrow. Just finishing cleaning up the horns. These are the ones I made up at the shop today. And it's a special set for this plane. This design is not a one-to-one -one setup. It's a nine-to-ten setup. So it meant making a special set of horns. It's a pain in the neck. Put these little straps on the horns. We got the horns ready now. When that step comes available, we're ready to go. the stab elevator. Caps on here. We're just going to pull the tape off. Uh, 
water. Of course, we're going to trim this off, put the 45 degree bevel in, and start doing the alignment. First thing I'll do is zone the sort of edges off. And we'll do the little carving job that's going to be necessary on these edges. I think one of the things everybody makes a mistake on is they try to rush everything. Good work just takes time. Good finishing, good woodwork, good dentistry. Good anything takes time. And if you try to rush a lot of these things, you automatically give up the word good when people describe them. It just takes time. All this stuff is just a bunch of little steps. If you follow the steps one by one, you're almost guaranteed you'll come out a winner. So full the edges as we go. Same as you would do in machine shop practice to break the edge on any part you're working on. Just dressing off this one edge right now. We'll do the stab first so that the glue, when we join it, can be drying while we're sanding out the other parts. Now, if you tend not to be good at carving, what you can do is lay a piece of masking tape on that foam part that's got the sheeting and let that be your backstop so that your knife doesn't go into the sheeting. It can be a little, a little bit risky doing it the way I'm doing it now, but just got to be real careful. You'll never learn how to build models if you don't cut your hands every once in a while or go through the sheeting or something. So why try to avoid it?
side sanded. What we're doing is getting the center line on the parts. some 400 sandpaper, sand this down. We're ready to do the other side and join them up. We got both sides of the stab sanded out now. I pulled my uh, cloth back so I have some glass on the table here. What I'm trying to do is get a perfect joint here. I lay the trailing edge flat, line up the center lines, and just grind away until I get a nice match. Now sometimes this part of the job will be a little time consuming, but I try to get a real nice fit on that middle. There's certainly a lot of other ways to do this, but this way has worked good for me so far. Okay, that's starting to look nice. Main thing too, keep in mind, we're trying to keep the center lines lined up. I'm going to get the center lines off by too much. where I can't see light through it anymore. I'll assume we've got it pretty straight. I put a test. I tape this piece of tape here. Okay, and taping it right there. Now I want to see which side has to come off. If you look at this, you look down at okay, obviously we don't want to sand that dihedral in. Now I know this high side is going to have to come down. Okay, so what I do is I take the tape on that side only. Just pull the tape back a little bit. And you know this side. Now when you dress this side, you only want to dress this one side again. Very little at a time. Very little. Now you can see we've got it relatively straight. I'm only looking at the center line. Don't look at the sanding. I want to get the center line going straight. Okay. Now that's a test fit. Do that with before you put the glue in. Because once you put the glue in, of course, you can't go back and undo it. Okay, now just pull this apart. Get out the old Elmer's glue. Joining a stab is usually one of the trickiest things you have to deal with. And getting it wrong 
can really be a pain in the neck. Now that idea of pre-taping it is a good idea. Assuming that uh, you get a chance to get it straight before you put the glue on. Now remember we're relying on the fiberglass in the middle of this to give us our strength. There's no spar in this. This is not a spar tail. A spar is one approach to doing it, but obviously a monocoque construction, strength to weight ratio has got to be better. you got to be able to build a tail lighter with the glass cloth than with a spar. Now you're gluing this up permanently, so you want to kind of get this lined up. It's not important to do it on a straight table right now because we're just doing a little bit of a, uh, putting a little bit of tension on the tape. I don't know if you can see that. With the tension that's on the tape, the tail has a bend in it. Now we go back the other way. Squeeze out the extra glue. Do the same thing. Tension the tail the other way now. So we're actually putting almost like a C-clamp on this. And we'll just keep stretching the side that's, that's low until we do get this where the center line is straight. Now we don't have it yet. I'm going to put a little more tape on this, get our alignment lined up in the center. Only look at the center line now. We can final sand in all the other edges. Now what I want is a lot of tension on this glue joint because I don't want a big sloppy glue joint full of glue. Stretch, put some tension on the tape. It's the tension of the tape that's going to give you that nice joint. Now you're going to notice it just pulled the other way. Bring it down this way. This is a good time to use up that tape that you have that pulls paint off. The real sticky tape. This will allow you to get your joint real nice in there. Okay, then the last dimension we want to check, pull up the glass, pull up the rag here so we can get the, now we need more tension on the back than in the front. Actually using the tape like rubber bands. Now see how that bowed out? And from the tension of the, of the uh, tape. Same thing back here. We want the same tension. So we really do have a highly compressed joint here. It squeezes out all the extra glue. Gets rid of all the weight of the extra glue. Okay, 
now we can put this aside to dry. Now this lined up pretty straight now. Now before we harden this joint up, we want to make sure for sure that we have this joint squared away. Let's make sure this has been drying overnight now. Let's see if we have this lined up now. Again, just look at the center line. Okay, that's good. Let's see if we got a good glue joint. Yeah, it feels nice and solid now. Okay. I don't overly sand this. Mike Rogers had his nice and thin and smooth, and of course it broke. Now luckily it broke on the ground, it didn't break in the air, so it saved him the airplane. But you don't want to make this middle of the stab extra thin or extra, no reason to make it even extra smooth. Just want to dress this joint off a little bit. Remember, this is 30 second sheet, so we don't want to go crazy on this either. I'm not going to spend too much time today because uh, Jeff got tickets to the Giants game. I'm going to watch the Giants hopefully, hopefully win a game. They're doing pretty good right now, so maybe there is hope in the universe for Wendy and the Giants and everything. The Jets are gone for the year. A good time to work on a plane, the reason I mention that, a good time to work on it, I find a good time is a football game. Because you can kind of watch it while you're sanding and doing little things that are productive. Once that's relatively smooth, that's it. I don't want to go crazy here. I don't want to pull a mic. The first thing I want to do with this, I want to take some thin, some thin CA. Now I want to harden up the wood in the middle of this, including the joint. Just a strip about a quarter inch wide I want to let harden up. Now, if these tails don't break right in the middle at the joint, they're not going to break. So this, I think, just stiffens up the wood that we have here. Just wiping it with a paper towel will get it good, too. Now I'm doing this in about a quarter inch strip. Just wipe it off with a paper towel. This will help too if a little bit of gas gets in through the horn. We don't wind up with a situation where everything is smooshy in the middle. Now, like I said, I've seen tails fold. My F-16, the tail folded because of a, a fellow at Reno that launched the plane and kind of leaned down on it. Made it weak, I fixed it. And I had to fix it twice before it actually broke, so obviously even neither one of the repairs was worthwhile. That strip of CA down the middle is really a good trip. They just have a nice strip of CA right down the middle. Okay. Don't have to do the hinge line because we're going to cut this out for the horn. Okay.
And in case you want to know, the Giants won the game. All is right with the world. We're back after the game. We can get some work done now. Now what I want to do, I want to lay the stab. I'm going to decide by looking at the sheeting which side is the nicer of the two, sheeting-wise, and that'll be the top. I can still remove it. Okay, one side I have a little bit of a, a glitch o -matic in it. I want the nicer of the skins on the top. This side feels perfect. I know where my hinge line is going to be right here. I've got it marked. So now I want to figure out, by looking at this, exactly how much of this plus about an eighth of an inch is going to be inside the body. I'm going to add an eighth of an inch to each side. And that's how much gets glassed. And again, the trick is not to super sand through that area. Well, that's for sure. tail lined up and can eyeball this. Okay, that's how much of the tail is going to go in there. And I just want to mark exactly how much of this is going to actually sit in the body. We're going to glass right up to this dotted line. The elevators, when they're deflected up or down, kind of makes a, a piece of angle line out of the tail. You'll almost never see a tail break once you get past this line. And the reason for putting these on here is we don't want to do any super sanding inside. Obviously, this is going to be inside the body. So why bother getting it too super sanded? But we do want it super strong without adding a lot of weight. And the way to do that obviously, is with glass cloth. That also makes a nice perch. When this sits in the fuselage, there's a lot of stress wanting to bend it and twist it, especially when you fly in heavy wind. So this gives it a nice perch. You're connecting glass cloth to the fuselage sides, which will have a little doubler in them, rather than just going 30-second sheet and foam. It'll make for a lot more rigid of a system. Okay, now I don't know if we can we can focus in on that. We've got that's how much of this we're going to glass cloth, and that's obviously going to be the next step on this is the glass cloth. Of it. Now what I'm doing, I'm taking some. This is half ounce cloth. I'm going to make my first layer of cloth half ounce. The second layer, which will just be a strip down the middle, will be ounce and a half. I'm going to just take dots and make a dot. Now I want the grain of the cloth on a 45 degree angle. That's important. I don't want to just cut the corner of the cloth. I want to have the grain going in a 45 degree angle. This way, every one of the strands is doing something. So what I've done, I've made a little tracing on this with little dots and, a, and an ink marker pen. I can cut out, just leave the dots on there. the 45 degree edge on these guys. 
on the elevator fronts. I'm going to show how to do that on the flat part, so if you missed that part right now, don't worry about it. There's a little trick for that, but I have that already done. And I didn't want to waste the hour because I wanted to get this glass drying. Okay, obviously now we got one little strip, and we'll make the second one. And this is glass cloth. This comes from Aerospace Composites. You get a, actually a double pack at six feet for a nine dollars. It's a real high quality uh, material. Pro Stunt Products sells it or you can get it right from George. It's a real nice cloth to work with. Sig sells it too. There's really a lot of sources for it, but this is the stuff I've been using that's been working real well. Now again, I'm making the same thing. Just dot. Now the epoxy we're going to use to do the glassing is the kind of epoxy you can either get from SIG or you can get from, uh, let's see, Hobby Epoxy makes it too. The kind where one tube is bigger than the other. Now it's real important to use that kind. I've heard that finishing resin works good, but I don't have any on, on hand experience with it. But I know this stuff works. And it's the one where one tube is twice the size of the other, you mix it two to one. Most important thing when you glass that is you got to let it dry two days before you try to sand it. If you try to sand it the next day, it turns into chewing gum and you won't be happy with it. Okay, now we've got two of these. And we're ready to go on this. And before I get ready, I'll take, now this is ounce and a half cloth. In the same way, I'm just going to cut a strip out on a 45 degree angle. So we're just taking a strip of this. And this is just going to go right around the middle when we're all done. Now a lot of people use or recommend, Big Jim recommends using ounce and a half cloth for the whole center section, which is okay, but I just find this way to be a lot easier to do, physically easier to handle a cloth, making two strips of it here, two equal strips. Okay, so we got our two, two patches lined up, two strips lined up. Now this is the epoxy that I was talking about. This just happens to be SIG, but one tube is twice the size of the other one. You can just get some Q-tips ready. I get a little denatured alcohol around here too. Mix this up two to one now, don't forget, two to one. Of course this stuff's got to be thick as toothpaste now. Well we froze at that giant game. It's a good game, but we froze. Well, I'm cold right now, we've been doing this. But like I said, the reason for working tonight, I want to get this done tonight. And that'll allow me to have this drying all day tomorrow while we work on the elevators and the hinges. And then the next day this will be ready for sanding. I built almost all of my stunt ships. Well, I build in the winter time, of course. This is in California here. I built all of them, almost every one, to uh, the tune of the Giant Games. So, almost by looking at uh, the Super Bowl year, I can tell the planes I built that year and the years they were 2 and 12. All right, hell with football. Let's get on with this. Okay, we're mixing this up real good. Okay. 
easiest way I know of to do this is get it up on two foam cores so you have the middle. Get on a little bit of the epoxy. Now the idea when you're doing glass cloth is to get it to end somehow other than just in a, a rigid stripe because it's hard to get that stripe out. You want to kind of fade it in, fade it out. Okay, I got my little piece of cloth now, and I can just kind of line up the dots here. Makes it just like lining up the dots, makes it real easy. You can kind of spread that out with your finger a little bit. Get yourself a little hair dryer. And one of these little guys from SIG, one of these little trowels. If you don't have a trowel, a razor blade is good. Low heat is what you want. So see, this is basically how we're going to do the wing, too. The glass core, 45 degree angle on the core. Air dryer it. Get out most of the epoxy. You'll find out this adds a matter of only about two or three grains to the tail, but it really does add a tremendous amount of strength. When you have a spar in a tail, you have a stress concentrator, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a spar. And even though some people do use them and do prefer them, this is definitely my uh, recommended way of doing a tail. You don't see many that a glass right break. In fact, I've never seen one break. This is going to add about two or three grains to the tail when it's done right. Okay, that's one. Now we're going to take that band-aid that we made. Same thing with the epoxy. Mix it right off the same. The angle is on a 45 degree angle now. Now for me this is real important, maybe more important than an average person because where we're flying here the air is terrible almost all the time. And you really wouldn't want to have uh, a plane with a weak tail in this environment. Just keep scraping the epoxy off. Low heat on a hair dryer is fine. Try to keep that centerpiece right on the joint, because that's what that's the point of maximum maximum strength has to be right on that point. And of course we're going to put some masking tape right over the middle of this later on so we're not tempted to sand through and get it all pretty. In between those dots, doesn't have to be too pretty, but it's got to be strong. It's going to be doing a lot of work. Okay. And needless to say, we can tack that down by hand, flip it over, repeat the same thing on the other side. <coughs> no matter what plane you're building, whether it's a uh, a pattern master, an oval, or genesis. If it's a foam plane, this is the right way I recommend to get that middle done. I don't recommend any plywood spars. Another nice benefit of this is the horn can cut into the tail a little bit, into that the stab part, the front where it puts itself, makes a notch for itself, and it doesn't hurt anything. It really doesn't matter. Now believe me, there's quicker ways to build airplanes, but I don't think there's a better way. I think you're really getting a lot of strength for the weight when you do it this way. You just let the stuff hang off the front, we don't really care about that. And you 
we'll see. You can get almost all of the epoxy off. The hair dryer is the trick here. These little spatulas are available from SIG or in body shops. You could probably use a business card, an IBM card, a matchbook cover. If you want to go uh, save a few bucks. This is an excellent way to do it. have about 15 minutes working time with this epoxy, which is totally adequate to do a tail. Notice I'm trying to do it the top and the bottom in a relatively short span of time. That's why I'm leaving the camera on so you get the message. Don't do one side and then not do the other side right away. If you do one side and not the other side, what you're going to find out is it's going to have a warp in it. It's going to bow itself up one way or the other. That's the other reason for using low heat. High heat, even though it'll get a little more epoxy off, it's going to tend to bow it. And this tail, we'd like to, like to keep it real straight if we can. Anybody that hasn't seen this whole set of videos, the first three tapes are basically building the body. This is the fourth tape. And this is basically going to deal with the wing and tail. And then we'll probably do a finishing tape on this ship. And we might even do a trim tape. Trimming the ship out. This is like a, uh, an upgrade of the Nova video, which basically dealt with basic stuff. This is a little more high-tech, maybe. I don't know if it's really more high-tech. It's different, anyway. But if you haven't seen the Nova videos, that's a built-up wing type of construction. And should be real helpful if that's the kind of construction you like. Okay, now we're just going to put this aside to dry for a while. Final thing we're going to try to do here is take a uh, and just kill off the edge. Work from the middle out. This will kill the hard edge where the epoxy ends. Make your sanding a little easier. This is denatured alcohol. This just kills very easy now. Not too hard. Kills the edge. Just a little break on the sanding by doing this. Now my stooge releases the plane from the uh, from the stab like a big mouse trap. I don't hook onto the tail wheel like a traditional stooge, so I need a, a good strong center and a plane too. That combined with the way the wind blows in the parking lot where Jimmy and I usually fly can be a real hassle. We're going to probably just set this aside for a little while to dry. Half an hour or so, then we'll come back and trim this with a razor. Anything that doesn't stick up, it's not a problem. The next step, we're going to work on the elevators a little while. Like I said on the video before, this can still be curing. Just let this sit up in here. We're going to use this to take some measurements on.